Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. We are broadcasting live from the Shul of Bozeman, Chabad Center for Jewish Life and Learning. I'm just going to share this on social media, and then we will get rolling. We're going to begin today in the Chumash that we use at our Shul, the Chamsa Chumash, the Life Chumash, the, this Chumash. I'm just going to show you what we're using. And we are beginning on page 155. Let me just uh, share this, and then... I will be, we will be rolling. We're going to discuss some heavy duty stuff. We always try to make sure everyone gets into the class. Share to a page. And the bottom of Montana. And we share that. One more share. Good evening, Art. Good evening, Danielle. Wish you could be here in person, but good to see you online. Copy link. Uh, good evening, Mendel. Good evening, Gabriella. Well done, here we go. Okay. We should have shared it now on all mediums, and we begin on page 155, and I'd like to begin just by saying that the, even though we're only going to touch on one detail of this story, one detail of the episode of Isaac blessing or aiming to bless Esau, Jacob coming in with his mother's encouragement and dressing in Esau's clothing, gets the prime blessings from Isaac and then has to escape with his father's recommendation to Padan Aram, to his uncle Laban. Then Esau shows up, he's fuming obviously, he comes back from a hunting trip, he has dinner for his father, and he finds out that the blessings were taken from him, he cries a bitter cry, feeling that, you know, he's one of those people that... Uh, it's interesting how people can be pretty negative members of society, but somehow when things go wrong for them, they have a whole world of people to blame, even though the real person to blame is themselves. So I do feel bad for Esau, but I wish he would have felt bad for himself and not sign himself up to be the troublemaker that he was. But the bottom line is he does cry. He is a human being. He does have human emotions. He does have human guilt. He does have human anger against his brother. But right at the beginning of this story, there's a statement that needs to be um, addressed and dealt with. And we need to understand why Rashi chooses what Rashi chooses as it relates to this particular statement. That's right at the beginning. So I want to actually, uh, uh, before we get to the blessings, there's a statement there that says Esau marries. So it says when Esau is 40 years old, he married Judith, daughter of Be'eri the Chittite, and Basma's daughter of Elon the Chittite, the idol worship, tormented Isaac and Rebekah. So both Isaac and Rebekah were tormented by the idolatry that Esau's wives were uh, celebrating. It's interesting that both of them struggled with the idolatry of Esau's wives. And, the, and, and it's more than just the idolatry. You know, he gave his wife the name Yehudas. Yehudas is a Jew, Jewish name. It says here, Judith. But in Hebrew, he gave her the name Yehudas. Why did he give his wife a Jewish name? She was a Canaanite. He knew, Esau knew that his father didn't want Canaanites in the family. What, what are you marrying a Canaanite? That was part of who Esau was. He played this psychological game like a pig. The Medrash says he was like a chazer. You know what's a chazer? A pig? What's unique about a pig? You ever see, you ever go to the, yeah, a, a zoo or to a farm and you see the pigs, they lay in the mud and what do they show you a whole day? Their feet. They have, they're laying on their back and you're always seeing pig feet. Why do they show you their feet? Because their feet are kosher. They have split hooves. They want you to see a whole day that they're kosher while they don't chew their cud. Esau was just like a pig. A whole day he walked around trying to show everyone how good he was, how holy he was, but it was just a cover for the sick, twisted, uh, murderous, rapist, idolatrous individual that he was. And it's very easy for people to get caught up in the sympathy for Esau because he had such a rough time but the truth is, he created the mess for himself. He marries a Canaanite woman knowing that his parents can't stand it. And then he gives her a Jewish name to like cover it up like they won't figure it out. Who do you think he was dealing with here? That he gave the name Yehudas. But Isaac was more hurt than Rebecca. Because remember, Rebecca, the mother, first of all, she's a mother. A mother has a harder time um, seeing the negative in their child. That's what mothers are supposed to do. Mothers are trying to, you know, Ayyidah mama. A Jewish mother always sees the greatness of their child. But more importantly is Rebecca grew up 
in the home of Besuel and Laban. She grew up with wickedness. She knew wickedness. She knew negativity. So therefore, even though it was very hard for her to watch her son on such a path that was negative, it didn't affect her the way it affected Isaac. Isaac grew up as a son of, you know, by the time he, he was born into the family, Ishmael was out of the house. It's not like he grew up with Ishmael. He grew up with, with, with Sarah and with, uh, with his mother, um, with, with Sarah's mother and his father Abraham. So he grew up in a spiritual cocoon. He never left Israel. And now his son, one of his twin sons, is behaving with idolatry, marrying idolaters. And so what the verse says next is Isaac has grown old and he wanted to bless Esau. The vision of his eyes had dimmed. Right, he was blinded, he, was, he, he struggled with blindness, and he summoned Esau's older son, and he said to him, my son, I'm here, and I'm here, he replied, look, I'm grown old, I don't know when I'm going to die, go get your tools and get me a, a meal, right, I want to give you a blessing, go get, let's, let's have a barbecue tonight, <clears throat> and during this barbecue, I'm going to give you your life's blessings, because I'm old and I'm blind. And it fits right in, Right? He's getting old, or at least the blindness seems to have making him feel old. And therefore, he wants to share with his son, his oldest son, his b'chayr, his firstborn, everything that he wants him to get. And then, of course, the entire parsha continues with the whole episode of, of Jacob swooping in and getting the blessings instead of Esau. Now here's the million dollar question. The Rebbe always, I always call the Rebbe's question the million dollar question, even though it's probably a billion dollar question, but we're going to go with a million. It's the first time we're reading in the Bible, in the Torah, it's the first time we're reading about blindness. And he was by no means the oldest person of the time, right? He's not, remember earlier in the book of Genesis, we read about people living till 900 years old, 800 years old. Why, how come they weren't blind? Isaac, on the other hand, a young, he was a young man. He was in his mid one hundreds. All things considered, back then, a young man. Why, why suddenly is he experiencing blindness? Because of old age? Makes no sense. There were people that were, like I said, five hundred years older than him. Right? Noah was six hundred years old. But he didn't get blind. Our Pasha, what do they call him in English? Methuselah, Mesushalach. Well, it's way better that. Uh, you know, I'm not sure why the, why the Gentiles translated Mr. Shelach as Methuselah. If they were already going to give him a nickname, they could have come up with an easier one. But Methuselah, Mr. Shelach lived till 970, whatever, 900 and something years old. He didn't go blind with Isaac, a young man, right? If Esau was only 40, so what was he, 100 and something years old and he's blind? Rashi's bothered by that. Rashi understands the primary, co- the, the prime commentator of the Torah, Rashi understands that the blindness cannot be naturally associated with old age because if that was the case, we have bigger issues. So Rashi gives us something which is unusual. Rashi gives us three opinions as to what happened to Isaac, to Yitzchak, and why he was blind. Rashi says, first of all, she be- he became blind, but Ashnan shall elu, with the smoke of those, which those, the, the those that we just read around in the verse prior, that they would... They would offer incense to idolatry and the smoke of the incense blinded him. So we know smoke can do a lot of different things. And so Rashi says that, you know why Isaac was blind? Why his eyes were dimming was because Esau married these idolatrous women who had their stinking, smoky, idolatrous offerings and incense and, incense, and that blinded Isaac. That's Rashi's first opinion. The second opinion, Rashi says, that when Isaac was on the Akeda last week, when his father, uh, or two weeks ago, when his father had him on the Akeda on the Mount Moriah, and he was going to be slaughtered as an offering, right? And his father was going to shecht him, slaughter him. And the heavens opened up, and the angels saw that he was going to be slaughtered, and the angels started crying, and their tears fell, and landed in Isaac's eyes and blinded him. So second reason Rashi gives is that it wasn't the idolatrous smoke, but it was actually something that happened to Isaac over 100 years earlier when he was, or almost 100 years earlier when he was 37 years old and his father put him on the altar to be slaughtered as an offering um, at the Akedah. 
The third opinion Rashi says, which is really straightforward, you want to know why God blinded him? God blinded him so that, he, that Jacob can get the blessings. It's very simple. There's no logic here. There's no reason for why he was blinded other than the fact that God needed him to be blind so that he should not see that Jacob is coming to deceive him for the blessings and so that the plan could come to fruition, which is that Esau doesn't get the prime blessings and Jacob does. So the Rebbe has a couple of issues with these, with, first of all, the order of Rashi's statements, right? First of all, why do we need any commentary at all? The Torah says, you want to know why he became blind? It says, because he got old. Except we already prefaced that by saying, if, if old age was the only reason, then there were people that were way older. So something, there has to be another, there has to be another detail here that makes the blindness logical. Second of all, Rashi never brings two opinions, certainly not three opinions, if something wasn't right about one of them, unless something wasn't right about one of them, because Rashi is a straightforward commentary, and therefore, what wasn't right about the comments that Rashi had to bring three opinions? So, it's a very interesting ep- uh, there's a very interesting thing that happens here, in this analysis that the Rebbe has on this week's Parsha, and I just want you to know that it's from the fall of 1967. So in the fall of 1967, in, uh, in November of 1967, when the Rebbe was addressing this week's Parsha and the Parsha after this, he, he discussed this blindness issue and, and said as follows. In the previous Parsha, there's a statement that says, that God blessed Isaac. And this is very important. You know, you could actually look this over, overlook this and not realize. It says, God blessed Isaac. And Rashi says, that Abraham was scared to bless his own son Isaac. Why? Because he knew that he was going to have a son Esau. And Abraham was concerned that if he gives Isaac the wrong blessings and those blessings end up in Esau, you can end the blessing and creating a real tragedy for the world if you give Esau the wrong blessing. So Abraham, the grandfather, was concerned about blessing his own son Isaac because he was worried that those blessings will end up in the wrong way. So what did Abraham do? What did Avram do? He said, Yahweh bala brachas, let the author of all blessings, which is God obviously, come and bless Isaac directly. So God came and that's why the verse says, God blessed Isaac. How is it possible that if Isaac is the one that got a direct blessing from Hashem, he should also be the one, if he's getting a direct blessing from a mighty God, that, you know, it includes some of the basic blessings. How is it possible that Isaac, who gets the special blessings from Hashem, should be the one that not only has a, you know, a challenging life with a son like Esau, but that he should be the first one in the world to be blessed with dimming of eyes, with blindness, which is one of the greatest punishments that a person can experience? Right, the Talmud says that Sumo Chashav Kameis, that one of the only individuals that is considered like dead, like death itself, is blindness. So the guy who gets direct blessings from Hashem should be ble- should be cursed or punished with blindness, which is like death itself, and he was only 123 years old. The last 57 years of Isaac's life, he was blind. We're not talking about oh. Five years of his life, towards the end of his life. 57 years he lived blind. And this is the guy that got direct blessings from God. There has to be more than just old age that tells us why Isaac experienced that. So Rashi begins with what's most practical. What's most practical? Look at the verse of the Torah. What does the Torah say? That Esau married Canaanite women, Basmas and Yehudas, and they had all these incense and smoke from their offerings. And you know what happened because of that? He got blind. Now what's the problem with that? Anyone have a problem? I'm, even gonna, I'm willing to unmute you on Zoom if you have an idea of what the problem with that first commentary of Rashi is, which is why Rashi had to bring other interpretations. Well, why did Rebecca and Jacob go blind too for that reason? Oh, very good. Very good, Jennifer. And, and Robin is shaking her head. She agrees with you. Or she thought about the same idea as you were saying it or before you were saying it. If, if the reason was that there was idolatrous smoke in the house, number one, what about Jacob? What about Esau himself? <laughs> Esau, Jacob, Rebecca. Furthermore, and this is really even a bigger question, why are we assuming 
that Esau, even though he was a, a son of Isaac, of Isaac and Rebekah, why do you think he'd be living with his, he's a 40 year old man with, with two or three wives. And I get he had idolatrous wives, which, which Isaac and Rebekah weren't happy with, but why would you assume they were living in the same house with them? In other words, what do you think? They came into Isaac's house and in the house, that's where they did the idolatrous offerings? No, there's no reason to believe that. There's good reason to believe that in Esau's house, wherever they were living with his concubines and his wives and his idolatrous incense, that over there they were doing that. But the idea that they were doing that right in the house and somehow it didn't affect Rivka, didn't affect Rebecca or Jacob or Esau, only Isaac it affected. Even if you say that it's because Isaac was more spiritual, that's all nice and dandy, but not when it comes to smoke. Smoke does not uh, differentiate between Isaac and Rebecca's righteousness. They were both very righteous people, the matriarch and patriarch of Judaism. And therefore, Rashi has no choice but to tell us a second opinion. It was a second opinion that when he was on the Akedah, when he was being slaughtered, the, the heaven opened up and the angel saw that Isaac, 37-year-old Isaac, the son of Abraham and Sarah, the chosen patriarch of the Jewish people, the chosen seed for the future of the Jewish people, was about to be slaughtered, about to be shechted. And the tears dripped into his eyes and made him blind. But what's the problem with that opinion? Anyone want to guess, Chaya? Why would that be negative? Like, why would that make him blind? Well, you know, salty tears go into your eyes. I guess that's a good point. I mean, there's no guarantee that tears from angels make you blind, but there's a better question that I'm looking for. It still took 50 years. (laughs) Very good. How many years did it take? He was 37. He's 123 now. What happened? It was a slow-moving tear. I mean, that's... so, So to say that the reason was because... You know, 80 years earlier, 85 years earlier, there were tears in his eyes. You would think that the blindness would come a lot quicker. And here, Rashi comes to the third opinion, which is very straightforward. And that is, God needed Isaac to be blind so that the process of the blessing could go down exactly as it was meant to be. And even though that sounds so harsh, so harsh that Isaac should have to spend 57 years in blindness, suffering with blindness, Right? Couldn't God have just told him, hey, we got a plan? Think about that. 57 years of blindness. And it's not like it would, if God would have said to Isaac, hey, listen to me, your son Esau, no, he's not getting the prime blessings. You think it would be such a shock to Isaac? Who do you guys think Isaac was? I mean, I get it. He loved his son Esau. And actually, I once heard an incredible teaching. Uh, I, I don't want to say, I, no, I'll say who I heard it from. I don't remember where he quoted it from. It's from, a, it's from somewhere in Judaism, either a Hasidic master of some sort. I heard it from Rabbi Y.Y. Jacobson about how Isaac had a special knack, a special touch for a child like Esau. He, had a, he, he saw the potential in, in a guy like Esau and, and it, it brought out the best in Isaac and how he saw a, a rebellious child, not just as a rebel, but as someone with a lot of potential and courage. I know the Rebbe addresses that issue um, in, in the sense that there's two types of people the Rambam talks about. The Rambam talks about a chassid hama'ula, which is a r- super righteous person. That's the Jacobs of the world. And then there's the Klevish Sitzre, the one that conquers their inclination. And that's the Esau's of the world. The fact that Esau didn't end up doing that was just because he had free choice and he ended up making the wrong choice. But not because he didn't have the ability and the inner courage to do it. And Isaac saw that. But at the end of the day, if God would have come straight to Isaac and said, listen, Bubala, my dear Isaac, my dear Yitzchakul, Itchala, listen to me, my dear Itchala, I want you to know that it's, it's, I know this is going to be rough for you to hear, but your son Esau cannot get the prime blessings from you because it needs to go to Jacob. He's going to be the father of the 12 tribes of Israel. Esau is going to be the father of the Roman disaster that's going to come later, the Roman Empire, um, uh, Antoninus and, and, and others that were going to lead the Roman Empire. He could have just told him. And by telling him, he could have ensured that our patriarch Yitzchak, Isaac, shouldn't have blindness. And yet... Rashi tells us that at the end of the day, God chose not to do that. God chose not to say anything to Isaac and not to emphasize the negativity and the problems that were embedded and imbued and and part of the experience of his son Esau and instead allowed him to be blind. And the question is why? 
Why? Robin. I'll unmute you just a second. Go ahead. I don't know. You have to unmute yourself. There you go. How's that? It seems to me there has to be a connection. He's blind to the faults in his son Esau. And it, I just can't get past that piece as I'm hearing you say, why is he blinded and blind for so many years? It just seems to me like there's got to be some connection there. I, there's no question that the blindness that Isaac was experiencing was not just a, a physical blindness. It was almost like he had a blind spot for his son Esau and chose not to see all the negative and only to see the good. The question I have is more about God. Could have God not found a better way to keep Isaac, um, you know, to, 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 so, so that Isaac doesn't have to be blind for, for five decades or almost six decades and uh, figure out a way to tell him, listen, I, I don't know how to say this to you, but your son Esau, who you really love, is not who you think he is. Then, then perhaps it's because what follows after. Uh, after Jacob gets the blessing, now basically Esau is going to blame Jacob for what happened. And maybe Esau was able to repent in the long run and do better, and Jacob had to follow the path he had to. He had to get, run from Esau. All that was far too compelling, and it would never have happened if Hashem had simply said to the father, hey, listen, don't give him the blessing. And how would Esau feel? Hashem said, I don't get the blessing? That'd be a tough one to overcome. Yeah. There is man his brother than God. Yeah, and there's, there's a lot of, and, and I guess what I'm about to say fits into that last point that you just made. But not what I'm about to say. What I'm about, what I'm about to share that the Rebbe emphasized in this talk that I think is just, it's hard to digest because of its, um, it's hard to digest because it, it sounds, it still sounds a little harsh, but it's so, so powerful. God understood and was sensitive to Esau and sensitive to what that means to a father to hear negative about their own son coming no less from God himself, that he chose and knew that it would be better for Isaac to have 57 years of blindness than for God to have to share negativity about another human being where it was perhaps unnecessary. And I say unnecessary, even though it seems kind of necessary, but in God's eyes, it's unnecessary because we can make Isaac blind. And then it's unnecessary to have to share the negatives. You say to yourself, holy moly, God cares so much about how Esau feels, about how Isaac is going to react to God saying to him that his son Esau is a Russia. His son Esau is a wicked person when he has so much faith and hope. And by the way, let's not fool ourselves. So much good to the world. There, there's plenty of good that came from Esau. Unfortunately, nowhere close to Jacob. And plenty of trouble came from him too. But Antoninus, there was always a relationship there. There was this very, very um, complicated relationship between the Esau's, the, the Edomites, and the Edomites and the Jews, the, the Romans and the Jews. It was obviously it didn't end well, but it was a complicated relationship because of who Esau was. Esau was complicated. And Isaac wasn't oblivious to the fact that Esau's wives were who they were and that Esau was who he was, but he chose like every parent should, not to make believe everything else doesn't exist, but to see the best in that child. Because it was Isaac's hope that if he sees the best in Esau, he'll bring out the best in Esau. So he'll zoom in on that part of Esau that's amazing. And what God, God says, I should be the one to swoop in and tell Isaac, hey, by the way, get, cut it out with your son Esau. He's wicked, he's, uh, he's, he's evil. And what if to make you blind? Don't give him blessings, give, him to J give it to Jacob. The sensitivity that Hashem showed not to speak negatively is the only other place I've seen it. The Rebbe quotes this as well, not in this particular talk, in a different talk, about Achon. You know, in the book of Judges, when the Jews go into the land of Israel with Joshua, so they come into the land of Israel, they conquer Jericho, and then they're going to Ai. The next stop after Jericho is an area north of Jericho towards Bethel, um, that's called I, A-I, not A-I as artificial intelligence, but the original I right over there in, in, uh, in central Israel. And they're warned, the Jews are warned, don't take spoils of war. 
Don't take spoils of war. If you take spoils of war, God is going to be very angry. And there's one Jew named Achan who starts pocketing spoils of war and God immediately removes his protection from the Jewish people and it results in calamities. So Joshua says to God, tell me who stole, who broke the rule and took spoils of war. You know what God responds to Joshua? Huh? Not, not very close. You just learned it last year with your teacher. What, what, did, what, did, what did Hashem tell Joshua, Yeshua? He said to him, what am I, a tattletale? You want me to tell you who stole spoils of war? <laughs> you go figure it out. Why couldn't God just tell Joshua that there's one Jewish guy named Ocham who took spoils of war and he's causing calamity. He's causing God to remove his protection from all the Jewish people. God says, I'm a tattletale. What's wrong with you? What am I, a snitch? God says that to Joshua. God didn't want to badmouth another human being. Especially if he didn't have to. We'd figure it out on our own. And the idea that God should be the one to share negativity and the impact that it has if God is going to be the one to do that. And so you look at this Rashi, you look at this one line about Isaac's blindness and what we learn is, more than anything, the power of speech and the importance of refraining from speaking negatively about others. It's one of the hardest things that human beings struggle with. And I'm not even talking about, even though I should, but I've done it. I'm not even talking about political issues, which has become so gossipy. I'm not even talking about, you know, occasionally in the workplace. I'm talking sometimes in our own homes, the way we talk to our own children, our own spouses, our own loved ones. And there's a lot of that negativity. And if God doesn't want to speak negatively about Esau, a guy who we know brought, brought idolatry into the home of the patriarchs and matriarchs. A guy who was known to abuse women. A guy, he, right, he, he, he was abusing women before it was a thing. A guy who was known to be a murderer. And God doesn't want to speak negatively, doesn't want to be the one to report the bad news. Achan, a guy who broke all the rules just so he could steal some spoils of war and, make, and create calamity for the entire Jewish people and God doesn't want to speak negative about him? What does that say about how easy we have, how, how quick we are to throw people under the bus, to say negative things about people, those that we know, those that we know personally, those that we don't know personally, speaking negative, ne- people only, honestly, people, because of the 24-hour news cycle, this concept that came about some 20, 30 years ago, I still remember, I used to go to my Bobby's house on Empire Boulevard, and she was one of the ladies in Kronheis that had a television. Except the television had, I think, four channels or five channels. It went channel two, channel four, channel seven. New York was channel, no, channel two, four, five, seven, nine, eleven, and thirteen. Robin, you see, I remember. We only had three in Kansas. Well, you guys were in Kansas City. <laughs> we were in New York. But we had, we had yeah, the Kronheis had five, six, seven channels. And PBS at Sesame Street and uh, Channel 11, you know, I, I can still remember it. You know, Marsha Kramer on CBS, on CBS New York, right? You got no, today you have 24 hours, they have to pump you with information, which means automatically we're get, we got so used to, it's okay to talk about everybody because they need someone to talk about 24 hours a day, which means you always have to have some, sac- some offering, someone that you're going to sacrifice on the altar of the news. But what that did subconsciously is it trained us that it's okay to have a cup of coffee and say, oh, you heard about this one, you heard about that one, what about this one? Negative, 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 and, and the result is, it's an ungodly way to live. And what the parsha says, that God was willing for Isaac to spend 57 years in, with blindness in order that God shouldn't have to speak to him negatively about his son Esau. How often does a teacher, I, honestly, I, I have to say this, I want to preface this by saying, not in Bozeman, my experience, this has not happened in Bozeman. But how often does a teacher say to a parent, your kid doesn't stand a chance. Your kid's a loser. Kind of had that. You, back in the day for sure. Uh, in yeshivas it happens a lot. And I don't mean necessarily those terms. Oh, your kid will never learn Gemara. Why not? So, you know what that means when you tell that to a parent? Forget it, I, I'm not even talking about the emotion of what that does to the actual child when they hear that being said about themselves, their self-esteem. You know what that does to a parent? 
God didn't want to do that to Isaac. Even though in the case of Esau, it was real stuff and it was really bad. Why should he be the one to do that? He knew that any father would rather have blindness, even for a long time, than to hear such negativity being spoken by God himself about his child. And that's the important lesson here. If God is ready to do that, how careful we need to be of what we say to people about them, about their loved ones, about them, right? Sometimes we want to give someone constructive criticism and we really mean well. And then <laughs> we end up telling people things that are really harsh to hear. So just the idea of, of, of what Hashem teaches us about the power of speech and the power of positive speech and unfortunately the power of negative speech. And if we could just all become a little bit better with that, then Yitzchak's blindness not only had a value back then, but actually continues to have value today. The 57 years of blindness that he lived with till he passed at the age of 180 has value today because Isaac had a blindness that taught us that blindness is better than negative speech. And then if we refrain from negative speech, it brings, retros- you know, retroactively brings blessing and meaning to Isaac's blindness. And obviously in the process also makes our world a very, very gossip-free, negative-free, positive world to live in. So next time someone starts a sentence and says, did you hear, did you hear that so-and-so... You could pause, you could stop them and say, I'm just curious, is it relevant to me? Like, why do I need to know that? Oh, you got a point. I did it actually recently, one time, like two weeks ago, I did it to someone, they started saying something. I'm like, whoa, 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 I don't think this is relevant to me whatsoever. And they go, oh yeah, it really isn't. I said, okay, good, let's move on to something else. Why do I have to hear it? It's not easy, because again, our ears, some reason they love hearing gossip, but we could be the one to, we could be the ones to change the language, to change the, change the discourse, and change what we hear, what we say, and how we do business, and it has a domino effect, a world of positivity, kind words, and good things, familiar with families, with friends, and the world around us. Have a wonderful rest of the week, and uh, we'll see you, Mirza Shem, on Shabbos, for those of you that are in Bozeman, otherwise we'll see you back here next week. Any questions?